300,000 tons of steel a day. 1,000 cars an hour. Food for 100 million people. Half the largest cities in America. Trade center of the nation. More universities. More fresh waterways. More industry. More agriculture than any other region in the world. This is the Midwest, heartland of the nation. From the Mesabi Range in Minnesota to the coal fields of Kentucky, from the steel mills of Pittsburgh to the wheat fields of Nebraska. These are the long horizons of the Midwest. Most of the world's population and wealth is found in regions near the sea. Why is America's Midwest an exception to this general rule? To examine the wealth of this region, we must first look at its land. Thousands of years ago, it was leveled by glacial ice. The vegetation which followed the ice left most of the land with a rich soil, ideal for agriculture. Now the Midwest has a rich dairy belt in the north to supply milk for the cities of the region and cheese and butter for export to other regions. The southern portion of the heartland is well suited to general farming, but across the middle of the region lies the most important agricultural area in the nation the Corn Belt. And it is here, in the Midwestern Corn Belt, that our story begins, with a man who has seen remarkable changes over the last half century. When I came here 50 years ago, 60 bushels to the acre was uh, considered a, a high yield. Today, in comparison, 180 bushels is a high yield. Mr. Charles Gunn, a Midwestern scientist who has devoted his life to improving the corn plant. 85% of the corn grown, approximately, is fed to livestock. The Midwest handles more beef and more hogs than any other region in the nation. This morning, John Pigott, a progressive Illinois farmer, is shipping some of his animals to market. Good highways and the modern truck have changed the farmer's method of getting products to market. This slaughterhouse, 40 miles from the farm, is the destination of Mr. Piggott's beef. When John was a young boy, almost all beef was sent by rail to the large packing houses of Chicago. Now the packing houses have moved out of the city. We still uh, sell a lot of cattle to Chicago. Swift has been out here about four years now, and it is a convenience uh, to, sh to ship over here, but uh, we, we still have to sell where we can get the best price. We're, we'll sell the Swift, and we'll sell the Armour, which is uh, over here at Sterling, which is 60 miles away, which is about the same distance as Chicago. But we just have to sell to the man that'll that'll give us the most money for the cattle. It's about the only way we determine who we're going to sell to. Midwest farmers are so productive that overproduction and the tougher market competition have become serious problems. Our big problem is that uh, we don't really have much bargaining power. When we go buy our cattle, we have to buy them at the price that the man uh, wants to sell them at. If we can buy them a little cheaper, we try to. But basically speaking, we, ha we give his price. And when we turn around to sell our product, we take the price again that they'll give us. 
and we're one of the few people that do this. We don't have enough bargaining power. We were going to have to organize as producers and uh, get in a bargaining position with these chain stores and the people that are going to consume our meat. Today the market was good, but next month prices may drop. This is the problem facing every farmer in America every time he buys for the future. We usually buy in the south, southwest. The majority of our cattle come from Texas. And my father and I, or either maybe just one of us, will go down there at least once a year and uh, look at these cattle and usually buy them then. We may not buy them the day we see them. We not, may not buy them until two or three months later over the phone. Hello, Leonard. John Pickett at DeKalb. How are you? Just fine. Say, uh, we're looking for some heifers weighing approximately five, six hundred pounds. Do you have those heifers that you spoke about earlier? Uh-huh. Those are Hereford heifers. And what, what's the price you're asking for those cattle? Well, that's a little bit higher than we want to pay. Our market isn't that good. Well, we, we'd rather buy them around 24 and a half cents at the highest laid into us here at home. That's right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll bid you 24 and a half cents a pound on those Hereford heifers if you want to deliver them uh, to DeKalb. When, when could we get those cattle? Cattle cost about $145 a piece uh, laid in here today. And we hope that uh, inside 180 to 200 days that they'll double their money, which uh, of course isn't all profit. About 75% of that doubling money we're talking about will be feed costs. But we, we would consider this a fair return on these kids. The Midwest has become the meat tenderizer to the nation because of the corn that it feeds to livestock. Mr. Pigott's farm produces two and one half times as much as it did 30 years ago. But the equipment necessary for this increased production is very expensive. Eight speeds forward and four in reverse, and then we get torque amplifier. You got 16 speeds forward. What's the price of this tractor? What's it list for? Well, it's it lists at about 72. Of course, now and the price of beef up where it is, you know, you know add a little to it, but I suppose you're going to take a little off, huh? Sure. In 1903, John Pigott's grandfather, an Irish immigrant, began a dairy operation on this land. The farm has remained in the family through two world wars and the Great Depression. Again, there are new faces on the farm. My father's been in the cattle business a good number of years, and uh, I, I always did enjoy it and uh, wanted to be in it. And as far as uh, raising a family, there's just no place to raise a family like in the country. And it, it's a good life, there's no question about it. John's brothers have not gone on to farming, and throughout the Midwest and the nation, the farm population is just half what it was a generation ago. When these children grow up, they will face an unusual situation. Constantly rising productivity in the face of serious farm problems. Poor marketing methods, high cost of machines and labor, rising land values and taxes. These are the problems which face the children of the world's most productive land. But farming is only half the story of the Midwest, for the land which provided the agricultural opportunities also gave us the beginnings of a great industrial boom. In 1837, a Midwesterner, John Deere, began to develop steel plows to work the Midwestern soil. 
few years later, Cyrus McCormick began making reapers in Chicago to be near his farm customers. Now, almost every need of the consumer is provided by Midwestern industry. The rich topsoil may have attracted the farmer, but in the lower layers of earth, industry found the energy to run its machines, energy in the form of coal. Now almost half the nation's energy comes from the Midwest. In Cadiz, Ohio, a large-scale strip mining operation provides coal to energy users in the heartland and neighboring regions. The potential power from the earth had to be matched by an energetic people. I am Craig Rappert. I have been uh, working for the company approximately 26 years. I started as a ditch digger, run tractor and boiled and finally worked myself into the position I am in now. The machine is operated by two hand controls and two foot controls. This is 105 cubic yards, which would be equal to two railroad cars of material. After the coal has been exposed, a small nine cubic yard machine will come in and take the coal and load it into 120 ton trucks. And the trucks will transport it approximately two miles to our cleaning plant to be worse size and dry and put on the railroad car to the customer. And most of our shipping goes north. Michigan's our biggest customer. From southeastern Ohio, the coal is sent across the state into Indiana and up to Michigan. But industry needs materials to work, and the energy resources of the Midwest are matched by large mineral deposits. Just below the surface of the earth in Minnesota lies the country's most important deposit of iron ore. Because of its ease of mining and nearness to the Great Lakes, the Mesabi Range has been important to the success story of industry in the Midwest. Ore is easily shipped to steel mills on the Great Lakes, which supply steel to the nation from Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Here in Detroit, raw ore arrives at a typical steel mill. The Great Lakes freeze up during the winter and are only safe for navigation seven or eight months out of the year. Therefore, during the shipping season, large quantities of ore are stockpiled at the steel mill to feed the furnaces that will operate every day of the year. Steel for refrigerators and toasters. Steel for lawnmowers and plows. Steel for safety pins and nails. Steel to be sent out all over the nation and the world. But the most important single steel user in the Midwest, as well as the nation, is the auto industry. The physical birth of every car is here in the infernal heat of the blast furnace. One out of every five pounds of steel made in America goes into an automobile, and the pattern of producing automobiles is typical of much Midwest industry.
From the mill in Michigan, rolls of steel are sent south to the town of Twinsburg, Ohio, only a few trucking hours away by modern roads. Here, the metal for our car begins to take a more familiar shape. Draw dive has a force of a thousand ton on the punch and approximately 700 ton on the outer ring, which holds the blank. Its running rate is approximately 430 an hour. Uh, I've been here about 10 and a half years. By trade, I'm a tool and die maker. I've been working with automation for quite a few years. They're shipped uh, throughout the country, anywhere from uh, Delaware to Los Angeles. Detroit, uh, St. Louis, Belvedere, Illinois, to the assembly plants. Although auto assembly plants have been built throughout the country in recent years, most are located within the Midwest. And Detroit is still uncontested as the auto capital of the world. And it is here that our car will be assembled from parts manufactured throughout the Midwest. Parts like the engine, carved out of cast iron in Trenton, Michigan, on machines made in the Midwest. In Jackson, Michigan, the tires are vulcanized out of materials shipped in the Midwest from all over the world. While the heavy products of the car are produced near the factory, the more delicate and expensive instruments can be made wherever labor is available. So it is that Dullivan, a small town in southern Wisconsin, will make the clock for our car. The Midwest has hundreds of light industry towns that subcontract for the large manufacturing centers of the heartland and the nation. And so our car is shipped in pieces to the assembly plant in Detroit. Some 15,000 parts in all are needed for a typical American automobile. You're probably wondering what these computers have to do with building carts. Well, when you go to your dealer and order a car with particular equipment like white walls, a clock, and a radio and a heater. That order is punched into cards that look like this. We receive these cards and run them through this machine. This tells the people out in the plant behind me here what to put on the car and when to put it on. Our car will be assembled in less than half a day. This plant turns out a car every 60 seconds.
The technology that built the car has brought us wealth and fantastic urban expansion. But sometimes centralization conflicts with the prosperity we've earned. Now more than a quarter of the nation's population lives in the Midwest. Most of the population growth has taken place in the cities because of the advantages afforded by urban living. It's wealth of goods and services. It's cultural opportunities. It's trade centers like this one in Chicago, where the law requires voice bidding on farm commodities. The wealth of the city allows it to support excellence in spectator sports. But the concentration of people compounds the problems of human engineering. With the enormous wealth that industrialization has brought us, we have inherited the monumental problems of poverty. These are the problems only people can solve. People like the farmer, coal miner, machinist, the painter, the engine builder, the auto assembler, the office workers. These are the people who face the challenges of the Midwest. 